Welcome. My name is Rodrigo Lohaev. I'm the, the host of Cyberverse Business Report podcast. This is really a show about technology and business and also the, the business of technology. Obviously, we focus a lot on the on the cyberverse, on the cybersecurity. Today, I'm delighted to have John McClure, Chief Information Security Officer at the Sinclair Broadcasting Group. Welcome to the show, John. How are you doing today? I'm great, Rodrigo. Thanks for having me. It's a it's a really a great pleasure to to have you on board and you know obviously we've worked together for for many years at 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 Lawyat. and you know I was just thinking a little bit through your career and you know dare I say it also my career and b- both of us share a profile where we worked in in many different industries always focused on the technology and and, and cybersecurity you know you started very focused on the government and contracting and then of course we spent a few years at the lawyer at high education with a with a global flavor and now you are at the Sinclair broadcasting in 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 broadcasting and communications and you know you're now part of the the critical infrastructure of of the country you know the, what we need to defend in terms of na- national security which is so important these days so what is what are really the trends the commonalities that you see across all of these industries how portable were all of your skills and also in contrast what did you see that is really different and characteristic and very specific to the to to each one of these industries Got it. So you're starting off with a softball question here. Hope softball. You, right, you, right. you you know me. Not complex at all, right? No, it's been it's been a great journey. I, I think I think there are the commonalities I think are you got a lot of smart people working on a lot of hard problem. And I think the problem space, though it, it there's some nuances for sure. Whether whether for example in the intelligence space, you're actually allowed to attack back, right? You have some offensive capabilities within the government. The government too normally isn't uh uh, while everybody has budgets, you know, you're, you're not keeping an eye on, on revenue quite the same way within some of the groups. I think, and, and I think across all of the spectrum of cyber, regardless of where you're working, the recruitment part is just a challenge for everybody, no matter where you are. So I think those are some of the commonalities. I, I think there's even maybe more of a recruiting challenge, depending on where, you, where you're recruiting from in the government. You know, the, the private space frequently will pay more than, than government pay scales. So I think that's a little bit more challenging, perhaps, at least on the retention side. It's a, it can be really exciting work, I think, in the government. You know, you're definitely supporting something bigger than yourself, bigger than a single company. You know, you're, you're, hopefully there's some patriotic feel in that. And I think that was, at least for me, fulfilling to be part of that and kind of bled through my military career mm-hmm. time and right into continuing supporting the government. The, the commercial space has been exciting. My first real jump in the commercial space was obviously working for you. And that was my real introduction to, to the commercial space. The, and in education, I thought it was interesting. It was also, again, very rewarding, right? I think we really supported an important mission in terms of education and affordable education globally. That was exciting. Learning the business of education, though, felt easy to me, right? We, we'd all gone to school. Right. I mean, we kind of knew what education was. We knew what, how universities made money, um, whether it was through grants or whether it was through student enrollment and in generally delivering IT to education was not exceptionally different than delivering IT period in many cases. You know, we needed computers to be up. We needed people to be, get in buildings. We needed to be able to secure the infrastructure but the business didn't feel exceptionally complex. Here within broadcast, this, this is a whole new whole new world for me. You know, we're dealing with antennas and transmitters and a lot of OT. We're dealing with the way that video systems interact with scheduling systems for running ads and, and running things live. If you go back to the old CIA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, so we're not talking about the the Langley agency, right? Right, not not <laughs> that, that, that is a different career, right? Right, is is its availability, right? All the time, all the time. You know, you can't be off the air. It's like waiting for a internet page to load for five seconds, right? You've already moved on. You've changed the channel. And like as you mentioned, kind of earlier, we we are part of critical infrastructure as defined by DHS. We carry the emergency broadcast system. We carry, obviously, local news, local sports. And so learning that business for me has been exceptionally different than anything else Mm -hmm. that in my career. That being said, I do think the role of a 
CISO or the role of a technology executive is similar, right? In terms of being able to lead, being able to manage, being able to manage risk, um, being able to recruit, retain, coach, mentor. I think those are some common threads. It's been exciting for me. I'm glad I've been able, been given the opportunity to work within different roles and industries. It's been exciting. It's been exciting. What surprised you at uh, uh, at Sinclair? What happened? You've been there for a little over a year now. You know, what happened in your day that you said, wow, I did not expect this? Yeah, I think definitely the complexity of broadcasting. It was interesting when I <clears throat> first joined the company, uh, one of our larger uh, TV stations that we own is WJLA. Actually, you probably get them from home, right down there in Roslyn, Washington, D.C. area. Very large channel of ours that we own in, in the one of the largest markets that we have, Washington, D.C. And so I went on a tour of WJLA early on when I first joined to kind of get to know the business better. And it was a really neat, neat opportunity to kind of Go through this station. This is, a, again, this is a class A, big, big, big station mm -hmm. uh, for us. A lot of big news operating teams. We also run the National Desk, which is a 24-hour 24, 24 uh, news channel that we run. And so learning, learning about that, seeing what made up a broadcast company was really interesting. Much later, I was able to visit a different station. WPDE, a station that we own down in Myrtle Beach, not Myrtle Beach, Myrtle Beach. It's in Myrtle Beach. I don't know. I went, went down there, got to sit through a live broadcast, which was insanity. It, it was crazy. It, it's an amazing, you know, I, I know you've flown planes before and it's like flying solo every day is how I think of it. I mean, it's incredible what, how quickly um, this business needs to be able to respond to challenges during a live broadcast again it's live so when we're when we're doing live news when we're doing live sports you know the margin for error is exceptionally small mm -hmm. it's not like oh i can wait another minute for something to happen i i have learned that one video frame is 33 milliseconds of time and so we talk about jitter we talk about latency we talk about things like that with an it the margin of error is exceptionally small and all of that all of that was brand new to me it's exciting to learn but it really, really new and, and so it, it put a, a, a different focus than than you know if we go back to the triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It put a, diff, a different focus on the availability side. This this cannot fail. It, that's 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 perhaps the the lesson lesson learned here. Hundred percent. You can't be off the air, right? You can't have a black screen on on somebody's TV set. So it it was. Yeah, and, and there's just heroic work is how I think of it, mm -hmm. done out there at the station level. And and we're a big provider, right? I was, I was talking to a company recently, and they were talking about their 60 stations and how much that was to manage. And we have 186 stations. So we've got that happening every day around the entire country. And so being able to keep up with a network that large and a number of properties that having to deliver things, again, we're always on is is a challenge again exciting challenge i think but but definitely yeah. a challenge and it's interesting you know talking about availability you know i i i have to bring up also you know something that happened to us several months into our tenure running information security for laureate at the time you know you know this was the under a year where where had we both of us were running information security for for Polaroid and we hit with this big cybersecurity attack in 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 Mexico in in all the universities there and uh, you know unfortunately probably you didn't even had time to unpack at Sinclair when you were hit with a major i believe it was a ransomware attack yeah we were right is literally day 90 or 92 it was Still under three digits in terms of days here. I was still learning the business, obviously. It was early days. I had, I had just actually briefed my boss, the CIO, Brian Bark, and I had just briefed our, our CEO, Chris Rick, you know, on kind of my first 90 days and mm -hmm. where I thought I wanted to take the program and what I thought we might need for investment and, and focus over the next few years, kind of three to five year plan. And and right, all, all this is public, obviously, but we were we were we were you know, hit by an attack that was very focused, very sophisticated. And again, just fantastic response, right? In terms of by the folks here on the ground, you know, we had, uh, we had systems still running out in the field. Those, they, those, those teams had to be incredibly resourceful in terms of 
How do they stay on the air? How do they keep broadcasting? And they did, right? And they did. It wasn't with all the tools that we needed and it wasn't with the key systems that would normally support things like teleprompters mm -hmm. and things like a weather maps, right? Things like that. They had to be much so more. People, people weren't suddenly doing doing the weather in front of an actual green screen and you couldn't see the, the, right. the, the it, radar it map. Reading from a piece of paper. Reading right? from a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 but again, you know, the, the fact that these stations stayed on the air was just miraculous because it was a, a very large event for us. It, but it really shifted, it, it resulted in a couple of things. What, one was clearly, it, it gave a lot of focus to, to information security and to, to cyberspace. It got a lot of focus. It got a lot of resources, obviously from the board as well, as they took, you know, really, really gave us the resources we need to recover quickly. As so well. it was suddenly raining Monday? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it, it was uh, all of a sudden... Right. We had much more. I, I was able to build the program much faster than I thought I'd be able to. But but again, everybody really stepped up in terms of obviously taking the event seriously, but also making sure, you know, that we when as we rebuilt, that we rebuilt in a more resilient way. And now in, in many ways, you know, they're within the community of CISOs within broadcast. You know, we've, we've got a lot of experience that that those other groups haven't had in terms of um, how to recover at scale, how to build differently. And so we've, we've really been able to really build a, a, a great team and, and a lot of the team, obviously that I think, you know, but that I, we worked and built at Laureate, quite a few of them have joined me here for better or worse. And it's great to have those kind of folks who know, know how, know how we've operated in the past and kind of help accelerate the building of this program. So yeah, very and, good. And, yeah. and so how did your program change, you know, on day 90, you presented this is what I want to do for the next one year or three years or whatever it was that you presented to your CEO and CIO. How did that change with the events of, of the following week? You yeah, just implemented what you, what you were planned or it, it had an impact? No, it, well, right. Some of it was the impact with speed. speed. Um, so all of a sudden a five-year program was a one and a half year program. We got, we got resources more, more quickly. We also were able to, I think, staff more quickly. Right. I think the staffing would have been much more staggered over the years instead of being able to mm -hmm. hire very quickly a, a larger. In terms of the, I think the, the, the plan itself, kind of the roadmap itself didn't necessarily change except for being compressed there. And, 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 and there was more, again, more hype, more focus. We were hyper-focused on, on hygiene and, and recovery and thinking enterprise and operating at an enterprise level, just the way some of the laws work in the United States, you can't own more than 39% of the broadcast space, which is interesting. I, I think I understand where it comes from. Obviously, if you own all of the news space, you really could influence the news and yeah. what people learn and know. So there's these laws about ownership. And so because of some of that, those laws and some of the way that that works, a lot of growth, and again, similar to to Laureate in some ways, right, is through acquisition. Acquisition, you divest, you, you, gain, you gain a station, you lose a station. But what that's meant over the years is that a lot of the growth has been through acquisition. We end up with a lot of different looking stations, IT-wise. And yep. in, in doing that now creates a non-standard environment. Now it's harder to maintain, harder to secure, all the normal things that come with non-standardized kind of enterprises. So I, I, I think it drove us more quickly to standardize, it compressed the the roadmap for cyber and information security. It also, though, what it changed was, in, in, which was a tremendously positive. Obviously, I didn't have a whole lot of tenure here yet. One was I got to interact with people I thought it was going to take me years to build relationships. It got you exposure to the entire organization. Sure did, right? For better or worse. That one, yes. yeah, yeah, definitely got me thinking faster. It made me learn the business faster. It also created a scenario where Groups that traditionally hadn't always worked together, though they probably would have benefited from it. Now we're working shoulder to shoulder, right, through this through this incident. And we all came out of it in a better place. That's fantastic. You know, you, I think that illustrates the the um, the big principle of CISOs, which is don't don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. Exactly. I think right. That's that's the lesson learned here. Totally. It's very interesting. You, you know, you talk about the infrastructure and 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 the acquisitions, and you know that that 
when when reading your your profile and knowing what happened to you in your career over the last few months at, at Sinclair, it also reminded exactly my my trajectory at at Lawhead, where from CISO I evolved to not only being in charge of information security, but also in charge of the infrastructure and cloud operations and so forth. That happened exactly to you. Why is that? Why is what happened to both of us? You you you, you think singular events and related events. Or should the CISO be in charge of the IT infrastructure? Yeah, it's an interesting question. We, we had, and me and my, again, my, my boss have talked about it quite a bit. And I think nobody will argue with the fact that you can, you can never just talk about security by itself. Mm -hmm. Right? It's always, and, and, and that is becoming more and more true for infrastructure. You can't really have an infrastructure discussion without there's being some flavor of security involved. They, they do need to be significantly more integrated. Whether that means that leadership needs to be the same, I guess, is up for debate. But when I, when I talked to somebody recently, they thought that there might be a conflict of interest. And the way that we talked about it was they said, well, the infrastructure people, they got to make sure it's up and running. And your job as a CISO is to make sure it's secure. And so those are two different potentially conflicting interests mm -hmm. uh, in an organization. And I argued that I didn't think it was, that we need to stop thinking of the argument of secure versus available and that they're not, they're not versus each other, right? And they, and they shouldn't be. I mean, we started our conversation talking about the CIA triad. And that, that should be, that should, should be the motto and the operating principles for every single good CISO is to take into consideration both confidentiality, integrity, and availability and have the appropriate amounts of each. Exactly right. And one of the things that I talked about when, I, when we were kind of continuing this discussion was that change the argument, change the word availability and change the word security to resilient. Right. Mm -hmm. We all want to build resilient systems. Now it can be resiliency from failure. It can be resiliency from security tax. It can be resiliency from anything, but you, you were building resilient systems. And so if you change that one word, I think all of a sudden now you're like, oh yeah, that could be a single leader, right? That's going to have the responsibility to make sure the systems are resilient. And so I think it's been great. It's been a whole 60 days or so that we've kind of combined them. But I think even just recently, some feedback from the group has been very positive. I mean, and, and I think it also destroys this false kind of wall or silos that get created between IT and security that I think really are a hindrance frequently and, and, and probably slow down things and make things less efficient. So I think injecting security right into the center of infrastructure will be very positive. Whether, whether we'll see that continue will be interesting. I think, again, a benefit that you and I have from our backgrounds is we both came from infrastructure type jobs, T jobs, where we got it. You know, we, you know, I've been, you know, I came from networking were kind of my early IT jobs. And so for me to step into an infrastructure role felt very natural. I think if somebody perhaps didn't have that exact same background and maybe I'd come from the application space or I'd come from a compliance, that might've been a harder transition. At right. the end of the day, it all, it all ends up with people, right? Oh. More than, more than anything else, you need to, need to have the right people. And definitely I think Sinclair has the, the right person for the, for the job. And, and it's, it's very interesting. You talk about the people, you talk about the infrastructure and the business, the investment is the, are boards sufficiently scared and aware of cyber security? as an integral component of the business of, of like you say, I, I really like, I'll probably steal that in the future of building a resilient business. No, no. I think, I don't think they are well enough informed, but I, to tell you the truth, I think that's our fault. <laughs> I think that security leaders still are very focused on being a security leader and not a business executive. Mm -hmm. And I think that too often, and I think that does us a disservice, and it does the business of this service. I think that, and, 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 and to give yourself some credit here, I think you, you were a real influence on me making that shift over the years that we worked together. Now, 
What, what will be interesting though, right, with the new SEC rules coming into effect, we, we anticipate in April, we'll see if there's many changes, but where they actually are now requiring a certain level of cyber expertise on the board, though that's very undefined what that is, and the fact that, you know, material incidents, also materials undefined, need to be reported for publicly traded companies on 10Ks and 10Qs. And so I think that that will at least create a requirement. How well it's fulfilled will be interesting. Um, but but I have seen more companies, and you've seen some, some very large companies doing this better, really not, not talking about cyber risk, but talking about business risk. And then cyber is part of that, obviously, as is a hundred other, as is competition, as is name, name your other risks. For business. I, so I think, couldn't that, agree I think more. the discussion is changing. Couldn't agree more. Cyber risk and, you know, for that matter, IT risk should be a business risk and not a, a technology risk. It's not, it's not actually the responsibility of the CISO. It's actually the responsibility of the CEO. The CEO is ultimately the the owner of all of all the risk including the the, the cyber risk just as any other risk and 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 that lead, leads me to to a thought you know it's very interesting i think you are one of the most active CISOs that i know on my linkedin feed i get pinged very constantly by by your 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 news and and your comments on the news that i always very look look forward to are we doing a good enough job? And when I, when I say we cyber secure, cyber leaders and technology leaders to really act as evangelists and talk and discuss about all of these risks, how important it is for us to talk about it and to keep up to date with all of these risks. Yeah. In a similar way, I think we're getting better is the, mm -hmm. is the good news. I think that again, I think IT just in general, let alone security, but, you know, we always used to be locked in the back room, right? Lights off, slide pizza. We, we were literally locked in a back room back back, back when we started at Lighty. Literally. Good point. Good point. <laughs> literally. You're right. You're right. The good days. Those are good times. The I, And I think that's changing. Again, I think because of just the heightened exposure, whether it's been created through large incidents that are very public, I think cyber and IT period are getting more of light sh shown upon mm -hmm. them. And that, and that people are responding. I think, and again, I think as we're shifting from this, let me just be a cyber geek to let me be a business executive, that's changing the dynamic as well. So I think, and you're seeing the industry change, right? There used to never be CISO, right? There, there was like black hat and that was it in DEF CON. And now, and now you're, you trip over them, right? They're everywhere. So yeah. I think the industry is picking up on that. Obviously, that's, a lot of that's because there's there's a lot more revenue around that as well. But there, the the industry shifted. I think there's more and more discussion about it. Whether it's colonial pipeline, whether it's you know the, the cyber war involving Ukraine, etc. I think there's front page news all the time now, and that we are becoming more active. And you have to stay up to date on it. You, you talked about are we doing that well? It's it's very challenging. I think the specifically the information security space changes much more rapidly than some other other parts of the business. You know, yeah. while there might be changes in strategy, accounting is accounting. When and I don't mean that's an easy job. I don't mean that you don't need to be highly trained and efficient to do it. But if you got out of cyber for two years, good luck coming back in. I mean, the, the whole dynamic has changed. The landscape has changed. Active threats have changed. And so it would be much more challenging, I think, to step out of it and back into it than some other fields. So I think you have to stay up to date. Yeah, no doubt about it. You have to stay up to date. I mean, in, in general, technology, that's that's true, but definitely in, in cyber in particular, that's 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 so true. And what, what does... What does the future hold for us? I mean, we continue to be hit by by these no, novel attacks and new types of uh, day zero attacks. And what's what what really worries you over the next six six to eighteen months in terms of trends and topics and how you see the the threat environment and the new threats impacting the business or is it the the threats that we always had? I think I, I think overall it's the threats we always had. I mean, like you said, though, there's new flavors on them, but I think at the end of the day, you're still protecting availability. You're protecting your data mm -hmm. you're protecting, and, and generally, to be honest, unfortunately, a lot of the old ways to, 
to get in and, and make intrusions and it's still the people the weak link right same stuff right <laughs> that that and it's the basics right i mean i yeah. think i think we've all seen some statistics it's like 91 percent of all cyber threats are thwarted with patched systems in a mfa right there's two things now patching a bunch of systems is very hard right i know we spent years really getting an incredible system going at, at Laureate together. And those things are hard and they, but, but, but again, a couple of those real hygienic things go a, a long way. So I think, but, but the attacks clearly are becoming more sophisticated. We are shifting from worrying more about systems to now worrying more about identity. I think obviously that's a big shift, mm. you know, where, and, and again, I wish I'd coined this phrase. I, I think AWS did, but you know, identity is the new edge. And, and I think that's a great, great way to think about it. Uh, we know that there is no edge anymore in the traditional sense of an edge firewall and everything behind it. That, that's, your, that's your nest that you have to protect that, that now you're, everything is everywhere, whether it's your people or your data or your systems themselves and, and protecting that has changed. So I think that evolution of defense has changed in terms of what's still successful for the attackers, unfortunately, there's a lot of old old stuff that we just need to do. Still better. the basics. It is. You know, it's been a great conversation, but we cannot do a technology show without talking about AI and 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 Chat GPT. And there's been a lot of conversations, a lot about the topics of how more efficient will attackers be to use things like Chat GPT and and and, and AI. Are the news being too dramatic or is just, just another attack vector? How potent is ChatGPT and, and AI in general and how much it is on the offensive side and how much it is on the defensive side? Is it going to make your job easier or harder? In the long run, I hope it makes it easier. In the short we'll run, do. I think it's making it hard. I think what it's done is it's lowered a barrier right? To, hey, I don't know how to write a script on that. I don't know how to, I don't belong to these very challenging IRC channels to that, that I'd like to get into to exchange things with the criminal underground. And so let me just ask chat GPT and guess what? Don't write me a quick script and it'll run. <laughs> it'll run. It's been incredibly effective. I think it's going to be fun the next few years with it. And I think there's some neat, you know, with the injection, like Microsoft with Copilot and some other products that, that the big, some of the big companies are, are leveraging. I think it's going to be exciting. The long run, again, I think as we get, get them built into the defenses, I think it'll be interesting. It'll, it'll, obviously it's going to totally change the SOAR space in terms mm -hmm. of orchestration and automation, but it like, like anything, I think it's a weapon, right? It can be used for good or bad. I think the first folks who are going to take advantage of it early will be will be the bad guys. I think overall it'll become, as always, an arms race where we'll both have similar capabilities and we just have to do it better. And I I agree. I I personally have a lot of hope, like you like exactly like you say, that in the long run it's going to be very beneficial. I think it's a technology that that is going to be immensely helpful on the defense side and increasing the, the capabilities of defensive teams. John, what a great talk. It was a great talking to you and uh, uh, I'm really in awe of all the work that you're doing at, at Sinclair. Well, Any parting words? No, Rodrigo. I mean, again, I guess people can go read our individual LinkedIn and see where we overlap, but I appreciate all you've done to help me get to where I am today in my own career. So thank you. And I agree. It was a great talk. I, I hope we do it again soon. We'll, we'll sure will. Well, this is, this is Rodrigo Loherro, your host for the, the cyber business, the cyberverse business report. You know, our conversations here have, are about technology, about security and the business, and they're all together. We are right at the sweet spot of, of the technology and the business about the technology of the business and the business of technology. It was a great conversation and check us out on, on, the, on your favorite podcast platform. Check, check me out at the Cyberverse Advisors and look us up on LinkedIn. Great to talk to you and see you all next week.